Well, the Bills beat the Packers, and I'm breaking it all down today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day. And as a reminder to you, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Happy Victory Monday to you. The Buffalo Bills defeated the Green Bay Packers 27 to 17, improved to 6 and 1. And got a win off the bye. I could make this the quickest podcast I've ever done. Things I liked, the first half. Things I didn't like, the second half. But we're obviously going to talk a whole lot more about it than just that. But obviously a very, very sluggish second half for the Bills and a very encouraging first half. So let's break it down. Obviously, I am... If you're watching on YouTube, you know that I'm in a hotel room after the game here. I I attended the game at Highmark Stadium, had a wonderful time, met a lot of great people. Thank you to everybody who said hello and came by the tailgate. We had a really good time. It was awesome, and I really appreciate all that. But if the voice is a little bit weird, if it sounds different, well, it's because I'm remote, and uh, I try to do my part in the stadium cheering on the Bills. And um, obviously they got the win, Uh, a win that I think we all feel some type of way about. So let's let's talk. Let's talk about it. We'll start with the things that I liked from this football game. And I liked how it started. Obviously, not necessarily the three and out. But after that, things really settled in in the first half. But can we stop there for a second? The Bills got the ball first in this football game, went three and out and I think the Bills have lost every coin toss this year except Baltimore. And in the Baltimore game, it was the a game where they were expecting a lot of rain later in the game, and so Sean McDermott opted to take the ball first and try to get as many possessions in as possible before the rain really kicked in. But if I'm not mistaken, the Bills have had the ball first in every single game this year. So I don't know what's going on, but they are they are not winning the toss and they are not getting that opportunity to start the second half with the football. And um, all the analytics tell you that you have a higher chance of winning the game if you get the ball second and you get the ball first in the the second half. And, And that just hasn't happened for the Bills yet this year. But I thought they played a great first half. It will kind of focus in on the offense to start, but, you know, you move past that first drive where you go three and out, you get the ball back, you go, touchdown right you get a touchdown drive Josh makes a big third and 14 run two plays later the one yard flick to Dawson Knox for a touchdown your next possession on offense the second touchdown drive you get a big run from Devin Singletary and then the 26 yard dime from Josh Allen to Stefan Diggs that was a great throw that was a great route there wasn't a whole lot of space to kind of put that football put it perfectly placed on the inside leverage it was a good throw. It was a good play. Third touchdown drive. You get three consecutive touchdown drives. That one was the most sustained drive. Eight plays, 80 yards. You never got to a third down. Cap by an Isaiah McKenzie seven-yard touchdown run. It was a terrific start to the football game offensively. Three touchdowns in a row and a field goal to go with the punt in the first half. You'll take that all day long. Played well. Ran the ball effectively at times. And I thought the Bills played a good game in the first half of that football game, particularly on offense. I really, really loved the way that they managed the final two minutes of the first half. I loved it. That was great situational football. That was great complimentary football. So Green Bay gets the ball first and 10 from their own 21-yard line with an opportunity to do what every team wants to do And that's double dip, right? Get the last possession of the first half. Get the first possession of the second half. The Packers were in a perfect spot to do that, and they were trailing. 
Well, the Bills force a quick punt. They get the ball back with 54 seconds left. Allen hits the deep pass to Diggs for 53 yards on first down, and then you have a Tyler Bass field goal, and you go into the half with it being a three-possession ball game in your favor. You like that a lot. So you have a stop on defense to get the ball back to your offense that quickly gets into scoring range, and you can kick a field goal, 44 yards if I'm not mistaken. That's what you – when you talk about complimentary football – Offense, defense, special teams, that's it. That was a great, great job finishing out that half. But I really think in totality, kind of just moving back just the, the lens of the first half, but the Bills ran the ball fairly well in this ball game. And we talked about the Packers not having much in terms of run defense, and everybody's been running the ball on them. The Bills did a pretty good job with that. They got bottled up a bit later on, but Devin Singletary, 14 rushes, 67 yards. James Cook, right, five rushes, 35 yards. He had a 41-yard catch. So James Cook gets six touches for 76 yards. I mean, that's great. You love that. I thought Josh Allen, the runner, picked his spots well, six rushes, 49 yards. Good day running the football, and and especially from the running backs where they combined Cook and Singletary, 19 carries, 102 yards. That's a a number you like for this Bills offense quite a bit. So first half offense in general, particularly the run game was good. Obviously some good plays in the passing game by Josh Allen, good runs by Josh Allen. Thought the pass protection held up well. Josh was sacked two times, but he only lost two yards. Three quarterback hits. And we're talking about the defense in the NFL in Green Bay that had the number one pressure rate of any team in the league entering this ball game. And the Bills were down Spencer Brown at right tackle. I thought I thought pass protection was good in this football game for the Bills. Stephon Diggs was good in this football game. Six catches, 108 yards, and a touchdown on eight targets. Was really satisfied with wide receiver one. I thought Tim Settle had his best game as a Bill. Kind of been waiting for this, right? The splash plays, the impact. That happened, right? He had a sack, tackle for loss, pass breakup, quarterback hit. Very satisfied with Tim Saddle. He, he, he was a, a big boost to the team. Greg Rousseau had a sack. I love that. Matt Milano with the splash plays, right? Five tackles, tackle for loss, pass breakup, and the interception. Had a chance to have a few more interceptions. But... He played fast, physical, and made splash plays. I thought Tremaine Edmonds played well in this ball game. Maybe not perfect, but if he played well, he had to make a lot of tackles against really good running backs. When I thought the front let him down at times, we'll get to that. Dane Jackson, I thought, played a good game with sounding coverage, two pass breakups. I think the special teams had a great night. Collectively, I mean, Khalil Shakir had a 17-yard punt return, did a good job back there. Tyler Bass, 2-2 two two on field goals, 3-for-3 three three on extra points. Both of Sam Martin's punts were solid, but what I really loved was the kick coverage. This is something we've been talking a lot about on this podcast, and I thought the execution on kickoffs was phenomenal. Tyler Bass put it in perfect spots that forced the return because you want the return, and the Bills kicked the ball off five times. Green Bay started at the 20, three times, the eight and the 25 where they chose to do a touchback. But that's that's a great job, and we talked about this. You're going to pay all these guys to play special teams for you? One of the great things that you can do is force returns, not concede the 25-yard line, and the Bills continuously do that week after week. And I'm not, I'm not going to let it go unnoticed, not on this podcast. We're going to talk about it because, I mean, that's 5-10-15 – I mean, you're talking about nearly 30 yards of field position by just forcing returns and asking the guys that you pay to go down there to cover kicks to do it, and the Bills do it. And look, very simple football. The further you have to go to score, the better, and the Bills embrace that. They don't just concede the 25-yard line, and I love that about this football team. So in terms of positives, the first half, right, in general, particularly the run game, Josh Allen made some plays. You got a little bit of a spark from certain guys on defense. 
Special teams played well all day long. But then the second half happened. We'll talk to that, talk about that in just a minute. But first, now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. It can be very difficult to focus on solving problems when you are facing challenges in life. If that's the case for you, I strongly recommend trying therapy. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. We've all had situations in life where we need someone to talk to, and I encourage everyone to be open to therapy. If you're ready to try therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You just fill out a brief survey and get matched with a therapist, and you can switch at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. All right, let's get into things that I didn't like from this game. The second half, right? The, the second half, send the second half to the moon. Bills got outscored 10 to 3 in the second half of this ball game. Thank God they played as well as they did early on because this game could have been close. Defensively, they started to get worked in the run game. And I think that set up some positive moments in the passing game, which was really, really rough for Green Bay for the first half. But then they came out, they're down three possessions, and they want to run the football. And then I think they set up some one-on-one chances for them down the field. And Aaron Rodgers reminded you that he can still throw a football, made some good plays. So it's kind of an interesting situation where, you know, they go out, they get 31 rushes, 208 yards. Those running backs are awesome, right? We talked about that. Aaron Jones, he's a stud. What a good player. Between that defense that Green Bay has, it's a good group, and those running backs and some opportunistic passing game, like Green Bay is going to be a decent team when it's all said and done, right? They're not going to go away quietly. I don't think they have the firepower to really go on a run this year. But they've got enough to win some ball games and be a respectable team. And in the NFC, I mean, you're, they're probably a playoff team. But they're they're down 17 in the second half, and they want to run the ball. And like I said, part of me was happy that it happened because I'm sitting there watching this football game, and there's you know, there's five minutes left in the third quarter, and they're running the ball like crazy. And I'm like, dude, you're you're down 20, you're down. You got 20 minutes to make up 17 points. So an interesting way to to try to get it done, but it wound up being effective. Their problem is they didn't get it going in the first half. But I thought the D-line really got undisciplined in the second half defending the run, especially the defensive ends. You know, those guys are just getting too far up the field. They're rushing the passer, and they're running the football. Rousseau fell for it a couple times. Von Miller a couple times. Get guys getting reached, moved out of their fits. They lack discipline in the second half running the football, but also I think you got to give them a lot of credit. Those backs broke some tackles. Those guys were tough to bring down. They brought it. Those Dylan and, and Jones are good players. So it's kind of a – Interesting situation because you don't like to see the struggles against the run, but also in in that type of ball game, you're like, okay, if this is what you want to do, go for it. It's taking you a long time to, to score and the clock is moving and you're down three possessions. So if this is what you want to do, all right. But the Bills could have tightened the screws a little bit and had a better awareness about the run that was coming. I think Von Miller said after the game that he was surprised how much they ran the football. Why? Why were you surprised? We talked about it all week on this podcast. That was their script. Now, I'm surprised that they didn't embrace it more early in the game. I'm surprised that when the game was three possessions in the third quarter, that they were committed to it. I think that's fair, but that was kind of a troubling comment to me that Von Miller made. 
So let's move on from that. I don't think the wide receivers and tight ends not named Stephon Diggs did enough in this football game. Very inefficient for Josh throwing the football and getting everyone involved. Hadn't been a problem all year. But in this game, they had, they had some trouble getting guys going that weren't Stephon Diggs. I think Singletary, Cook, and Diggs, those guys were the best players on offense, right, in terms of the weapons. But there wasn't efficiency throwing the ball to Gabe Davis. There wasn't enough volume to the other guys, whether that's Knox or McKenzie, Shakir. It's just for the depth of weapons that you have on offense, I would have expected them to get going a little bit more in a game like this. So I don't think they did enough. And then Josh Allen himself. I mean, the second half of that ball game is one of the worst halves I've seen from Josh Allen in a long time. Two awful interceptions. Had a chance to really put that team away and just didn't, right? The first interception, he's laid across the middle of the field on a an entire sequence of offense that just felt like it was hard and forced and they just weren't efficient and, and struggled, right? And I get the Packers defense is good. We talked about this this week on this podcast. That the Packers defense matches up well with the Bills. I didn't I thought the Bills would have some challenges, but the execution was what bothered me. It didn't feel like it was a talent problem. I thought it was just execution. So Josh is laid across the middle. And, and no clue what he was thinking or seeing in that red zone interception. I mean, that was that was not the Josh Allen I'm used to watching in the second half. He didn't play great. But overall, I just felt like the team kind of fell flat in the second half and lost its urgency. And it makes me question, does this play into what I talked about on the Friday podcast about how the team has looked now the last four years coming off the bye? It felt like early watching the game that it wouldn't be the case, right? You Really satisfied with the first half. Really satisfied. Started and finished it really well. But that second half performance was troubling. Now, you you say that, and you win by 10 in the NFL, right? Like, you play a bad second half, and you might say the team was flat or however you want to describe it, and you still win by 10. But that second half was very uninspiring, and, and I, I, for one, just I don't love the way that it made me feel walking out of that stadium. And I, I'm not sure that there's a panic button to push or – you have to make it more than it is, right? I don't think that's necessary. But when we're talking about this game in a vacuum, you know, it was kind of a troubling finish to the to the ball game. You want to see your team play well for 60 minutes. They played well for 30. The last thing that I want to mention in things I didn't like is now we got a couple injuries to worry about. That Jordan Poyer, the big one, elbow injury. Um I saw it happen. And he's kind of squeezing his fingers, and you could tell he was very uncomfortable. He tried to finish, I think, the that that series and wound up, you know, coming out for the rest of the game. I I think he had an X-ray after the game. He's got an MRI on Monday. He said he heard a pop. You don't. I just don't like the way that sounds. I don't like the way that sounds. So we'll we'll see what McDermott tells us on Monday, if anything. But at some point, we'll know. But I don't like that Poyer has that elbow situation. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the same one he injured um, in training camp. David Questenbury, who filled in for Spencer Brown, got an x-ray after the game. As far as I understand, he finished the game. But there was reports out there that he got an x-ray after the game. So we'll need to monitor that. So hopefully it's nothing. But I don't know if Spencer Brown's going to be ready for next week and I don't know what the implications here are for Questenbury. So we'll obviously have to pay attention to that throughout the course of the week. Whether you're looking to pop the question, have a milestone to celebrate, or want to let your love sparkle, Blue Nile can help you make your celebrations even more memorable. As the original online jeweler, Blue Nile offers the largest selection of independently graded diamonds and pieces priced significantly below traditional retailers. Blue Nile has helped millions of couples create their perfect engagement ring. Their easy online tools let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as the setting style. 
you're looking for a fine piece of jewelry to commemorate a special milestone, but maybe you're having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7 available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Make your moment sparkle with Blue Nile. Go to BlueNile.com and use code Locked On to save $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's B-L-U-E-N-I-L-E.com, code Locked On to save $50 on your purchase of $500 or more. BlueNile.com, code Locked On. All right, let's close things out today by reflecting on my predictions, little AFC East recap, and talking about what's next for the Bills in this podcast. My predictions, eh, we didn't do great this time. My first one was James Cook gets multiple targets in the passing game. And the entire point that I was trying to make with this prediction was I thought this was a game where James Cook was going to really get an opportunity to have some level of involvement. And predictively, I said he would have multiple targets. He didn't. He had one target. So I, I got it wrong, but I think there's something to be said for him having a bit more opportunity in this ball game, where there was pretty much two series where it was his opportunity to play. And I thought he was a net positive to the team. James Cook, I think, had his best game. And so that was encouraging. You love to see the catch and run, some explosive runs, you know, just getting the ball out of the backfield. I thought he played well. And so we'll see. I know there's a lot of rumblings out there about the Bills and you know, reaching out about Christian McCaffrey and reaching out about Alvin Kamara. Well, that says something, right? It says the Bills are definitely thinking about making a move here at running back. And we'll know. We'll know the trade deadline's uh, November 1st. So we'll find out soon enough, and we'll talk about what we need to talk about. But I thought James Cook played well in this ball game. But anyways, I didn't, I didn't get the prediction right, so we can move on. Number two is this would be the most passing yards uh, for the season allowed by Green Bay. Uh, 269 was the previous high allowed week one to Minnesota. And, of course, the Packers, the number one passing defense in the league in terms of limiting yards, uh, 168 going into the game. So I predicted Josh Allen would have 270 or more. That didn't happen. Not even close, Josh Allen. 218 passing yards in this ballgame. Packers got a nice defense. Number three, I predicted the Bills would get their first forced fumble of the season on defense. That didn't happen. The Bills have now played, what, seven ball games, have not forced a fumble. That's crazy to me. Number four, I got this one right. I said the tight ends would combine for under 75 yards. And, and when I say tight ends, I meant all of them, both teams. Point being that the Packers have allowed the fewest yards in the NFL to tight ends, 197 going into the game. The Bills at 290 were the eight. Well, uh, the eighth fewest, so both by 25%, or if you want to look at the other way around, the top 25% in limiting tight end production this year. Both these teams are that, and you saw it in this game because I was right about that. It was 54 total yards for tight ends, 10 for the Bills, right? Just 10 receiving yards from Dawson Knox. Good thing one of them was a touchdown, and 44 for the Packers. So both of these teams that are great at limiting tight end production remained good at limiting tight end production. And look at the Packers. I mean, they've now played eight games, and they've given up a, a 207 total receiving yards to tight ends. So we got that right. And we also got the last one right. Said the Bills would win. And I actually predicted the score correctly, 27-17. to 17. So uh, from a score perspective, and in, in, in a lot of ways, a game script – perspective. I don't think that it would be a complete tale of two halves where the team looked one way in the first half and looked a completely different way in the second half. I thought that it would be more of a, um, a spread out situation where the Bills would have some good, good drives and have some flat drives. And I wasn't exactly sure if it would be like a game where the Bills were winning 24 to 17 and got a late field goal to go up two scores or if it would be a 27 to 10 situation and Green Bay would score to kind of make it look a little bit closer but anyways I think the game kind of looked how I thought it would and so I don't want to act like I don't want to overreact to to what I expected to happen I think it's just when you take that first half and how you felt after that and compare it to the second half and how you felt after that you know it's just it's just an odd feeling coming out of this game 
but I did predict the score correctly, and I predicted that the Bills would win. The Bills are six and one. Let's let's not lose sight of that. They're six and one, number one seed in the AFC, number one uh, in the AFC East. They're exactly where they want to be right now. The Jets are the number uh, two, uh, number two in the AFC East. They're the five seed in the AFC playoffs right now. The Jets they fell to five and three. They lost twenty two to seventeen to the Patriots. Third in the AFC East is the Dolphins. They're five and three now. They uh, beat the Lions thirty one to twenty seven. So third in the AFC East, six seed in the AFC. So right now the the AFC East has three playoff teams, and everybody is five hundred or better. The Patriots they beat the Jets. 22 to 17. So they moved to four and four. And they're the nine seed in the AFC playoffs and fourth in the division. So for a, a division that I don't think many people thought was among the best in football, you've got four teams that are 500 or better and, and three of them in the playoffs right now. So AFC East looks uh, pretty formidable. And speaking of that, the Bills uh, next game is a division game. Road date with the Jets, 1 o'clock on Sunday. The Bills are looking for their first division win of the season. Only had one division game, obviously, the Dolphins in week three. So those will be coming up uh, uh, pretty frequently here the rest of the way. So the Jets on the road next week. Next for this podcast is herd mentality. So we'll uh, we'll get that recorded for you tomorrow. Got an early morning flight. Um, we're, it's 2.30 a.m. right now as I record this podcast Got a 7 a.m. flight to get back to uh, Charlotte and make sure that we're home in time to go trick-or-treating with our our daughter. I can't wait for that. But we had a blast at the game. And like I said at the beginning, got a chance to meet so many great people and and really appreciate everyone that took the time to to come by and say hello and um, got a chance to sign some books and take a lot of pictures. It was really, really fun. So thank you to everybody who came by. And every time I get ready to leave Western New York, which is going to happen in a few hours for me here, I always can't wait for the next time that I come back. So I don't have anything scheduled right now, um, but I'm sure that'll change. I love coming up here and and being around Bill's Mafia and being a part of this community and just how awesome it is. Feels, feels like home. It really does. You guys are awesome. And thanks for, uh, thanks for embracing me and and listening to the podcast. And every time I'm up here, I, I, I just feel so supported. I appreciate that so much. It's, it's really, really cool. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today. Tomorrow, Herd Mentality, so um, looking forward to that and, and seeing what questions you guys have and uh, spend some time answering them. And obviously, the trade deadline's coming up, so we should have some fun stuff here this week in addition to getting ready for the New York Jets. So make sure that you are subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great Victory Monday. Happy Halloween, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.